Hey guys, and welcome back to Divine Journey 2. Last episode, we automated the Hellfire Forge. We made some upgrades to our Blood Altar, and got the Incense Altar. Brewed some potions, and made some changes to the things we're farming over here. At the very end of last episode, we finished off by trying to create this spawner here to automate Evil Craft Blood. Between episodes, I did go ahead and finish this thing off. So here we are spawning Catalines and Cyclops. We need the drops from these guys for the Blood Magic Essences and Reagents. But it also happens that these guys have pretty high HP, which does affect the amount of blood that you get from these guys. So just below this setup, we have the spikes there, and then this is output to a tank. We have a portable thermal expansion tank, which can hold 500,000 millibuckets of blood. And that is output to an ender tank, where we're going to hook the other side up to our blood infuser. The drops are picked up by the absorption hopper and put into this ender chest, which is connected to our main mob farm downstairs. And the EXP from these guys, we're just trashing. So yeah, this thing has only been running about 20 minutes or so, and we have 16,000 in the ender tank, and 72,000 in the portable tank. I have been watching this thing, and I'm aware that I don't really want to overspawn mobs. In fact, I had to downgrade the capacitors, so we're only using simple capacitors in both of these spawners. Just so that we don't end up with too many mobs in this one place. But it seems to be okay with these two configurations we have here. So the blood from that ender tank we want to send into this blood infuser, so that we can automate all of these recipes. So one thing I'm not sure about is if this is a sided machine. I'm not sure if we have to input items or liquid from specific sides. But uh, I think we can just tuck it in this little corner over here. So the first recipe I'd like to put in for this thing is the undead sapling. And this is going to allow us to build out our incense altar. As to craft the multi-block for this thing, we need some of these wooden paths which take the undead planks. And the trees unfortunately don't drop any saplings, so we have to craft them every time. And it costs 25,000 blood per tree. So let's encode this recipe and let's see how this machine works. So we can have our ender tank on top, and this I've set to triple red, naturally. <laughs> so can we auto output this thing? We can, awesome. Alright, we'll put in our promise of tenacity. So now, can we request the undead saplings? Mm, doesn't look like it does, okay, I think we need a buffer for this. Okay, so I had to switch this around just a little bit. Instead we have the interface underneath the chest, and then we have a hopper underneath as when we had extract from the top, it was pulling out the input item. So it seems that the output item has to come out from the bottom. So the interface will put the dead bush in the chest, and then that will be extracted on brown into this blood infuser, and then extracted via the hopper back into the interface. And I did break this and void a whole bunch of blood. <laughs> it was like over 100,000 of this stuff. So yeah, now that we have this all made, I'm going to farm up enough materials to craft out our incense altar. This is going to allow us to get enough blood magic blood to complete out the rest of these tier 3 essences, as well as to pass enough time to build up enough evil craft blood to complete out the rest of this chapter. Also, I wonder how we're going to get sunflowers. Hmm, I've really no idea how to farm these things. So if you didn't see last episode, I was wondering how we were going to get sunflowers and I completely forgot about the bone meal and vanilla mechanic. So I just got done setting up this very basic setup to automate sunflowers. And the sunflowers we use in the alchemy table for Tempestus. This is the tier 3 essence. So I've set up an interface here to supply bone meal to a mechanical user, which is set to only activate with a redstone signal, which uh, looks at this level emitter here, which is set to emit a redstone signal when we're below 128 sunflowers in our system. But once it's bone meal, it's collected by this vacuum chest and then output to a drawer with a storage bus below this. And yeah, this should just passively give us sunflowers. There was so many comments about this as well. I feel like I had to address it right at the start here. Also, before just before I set that up, I also fixed our ink farm here. So it was a couple of episodes ago where we set this up to give us ink sacks. But I noticed uh, last episode actually that this thing kept running even if the drawer was full. So I've added some extra redstone logic to this. So to fix this, I added a redstone upgrade on this drawer, which emits a redstone signal when it's full. That turns on the redstone dust below it, where it's inverted by the redstone torch, and then sent up a block, where this is connected to an AND gate from Project Red. And this will only output the front if all three sides are powered. So this other side is the scanner, which scans for the correct or the fully grown ink bush. So we want this to check if the bush is fully grown and also there's space in the drawer. And if those two conditions are true, then it sends a redstone signal to the block breaker, which will break the block in front of it. And then from there, it just functions as normal. So that was just another quick fix that we made here. But uh, yeah, back to farming undead wood for the incense altar. Oh, and you know what? We also need the cocoa beans for cookies. We may as well add that to the little mechanical user setup we've just created there. I just remembered about this passing this tree from last episode. 
Aha, and now we have automated cocoa beans. So I just decided to stack it on top of the sunflower and we're once again level them in for 128 here. All right, so I farmed up enough undead wood to create our wooden paths here. And I've set up the basic infrastructure for the incense altar. So I'm not entirely sure on the specifics of this thing, but the way it works is we have to have path blocks in these spaces. And then on these 3x3, three three, there's various materials which uh, increase the tranquility you get from this incense altar, i.e. the amount of blood you get per sacrifice. And there is diminishing returns on this, so it's best to have variety when you're placing these items around here. But to check our tranquility, we can craft the divination sigil. It was a bit tedious to craft this, but we just put in recipes for everything in the applied energistic system. And we combine this with blank slate and engineer's goggles. And this was very heavily used in interactions, but it's, we get this quite late here. Yeah, you can see up in the top left corner, it's kind of blocked by this jet plate UI. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know what that means. I think it means we're getting 60 tranquility from this. And the maximum for just the wooden paths is 60, so it looks like we are maxing this thing out. If we want to upgrade it further though, we have to craft the next tier of path, which is the stone brick path. And this thing, I think, can take it up to 120. But I already tried this out and it's actually <laughs> kind of crazy the amount we're already getting for this. So currently we're at 6,000 capacity in the blood alert. If we sacrifice once, we got to 13,000. So yeah, I would say this is a pretty worthwhile investment, considering we already had to get the essences anyway. It's not much of an extra cost to set this thing up. And again, we will be switching to automated LP generation via rituals once we unlock those in chapter 17. Cool, so now that we have some upgrades for our blood magic, let's work on the rest of the tier 3 essences and try to close out this chapter. So most of the tier 3 essences actually at this point are not going to be too bad. We have the Crepitus, which we made as part of the Dull Dust. So we already have the recipe for this one. The Tempestus needs a couple more recipes, primarily for the weather container. But we have Crystallos automated already, and we of course just automated Sunflowers. So we can encode a recipe for this one. The Offensa Essence we've made before for the Spikes, actually, for Evil Craft. And the last one is Virtus, which is actually probably the easiest one here. We just need a recipe for this one. So we have our Offensa. Tempestus just finished crafting. And we have a spare Crepitus for the quest. And finally, we need Virtus, which we're missing some Aether. Yeah, we should really fill, try to fill up the buffers on these passive alchemy tables here. But for that, we need a few more Blood Orbs. The Blood Orbs, though, at this point should be a lot cheaper now that we have automated blood. We can make these Tier 2 ones uh, quite easily now that we have the Blood Infuser to make these Dark Power Gems. And the last essence, Virtus, has just finished crafting. And there's our quest. Alright, so before we move on to this cracked runic plate, which I think gets us into the ender crafter stuff. Yeah, we need the ender crafting to unlock Batania. We're also going to need some of these tier 3 reagents. So we have the neutral reagent, we have this all automated by now. The tempest reagent is an interesting one which we'll come back to. Uh, this does also take a speed 4 potion. Same with the damage reagent, although I think we, yeah, we made the instant damage last episode. And the strength reagent also takes another potion. So I just decided to add to our potion wall here and we now have, I believe, all the potions we need for blood magic. So the first three we have here is Haste, Harmon and Blash Potions of Harmon 2. These three we had last episode, but I've since added the other three that we need, so the Absorption, the Strength and the Swiftness. And when I was setting these up, I tried to do Potion Brewers uh, before the Fractionating Still steps, but uh, for some of the recipes it didn't work, so I, I thought it would just be easier just to do these Alchemical and Brewers. And these are very cheap machines at this point anyway. But yeah, these machines are still not upgraded, so they're still very slow to work here. And in fact, we're sharing the Awkward Potion between three setups, so it could do with a few more of these to make Awkward Potion. But since we don't have the reagents on passive yet, I don't think that's going to be necessary at the moment. So let's just have a quick look just to see if there's anything else here. There is this Windmill. Okay, Red Coal I think is something we're going to have to automate. This is made in the resonator with blocks of coal, but everything else here can just get a crafting recipe. Yeah, we have Stoneburn automated, we have GP powder, we have treated wood. Uh, the speed upgrades, we have all of this automated, and the wind chime needs... Oh, this needs red cedar wood. It has to specifically be this totemic red cedar. Alright, we can handle that. We have uh, some spare space in this tree farm. So I've added red cedar here, which also goes into the ender chest, and that is buffered in the same farm drawer network over there. So this will give us the red cedar wood we need for the wind chimes. So that should mean we have the tempest reagent, and then the damage one, we made this before, this is all automated. And the strength one is, what is this, pink slime? Yeah, we can do this. 
Uh, some copper coils. Oh, this is <laughs> brings us back to copper wire. Okay, I think we're gonna have to automate this metal press. So yeah, let's look into doing the metal press, and that should be the last component we need for this one. So for the metal press, I think we're actually just gonna leave the one that we have here, and we'll create a separate one over next to where the sunflowers are, next to the engineer's workbench. This whole room at this point is pretty much obsolete, but I think we will keep it just to remember what we used to have to work with. <laughs> <laughs> Although I guess we are still having to work with this metal press. So yeah, we just have to gather up some of these materials and I guess we'll need two of these since we need to create wires from plates. In fact, you know what? Let's not use immersive engineering to do plates. One metal press is already one too many. <laughs> so let's use the compactor here while we can. So let's see if I remember how to build this thing. Is this correct? It is correct, nice. So we will need some more channels over here, although I think we were running out of channels back here. This is just a regular flux cable, and yeah, we're using the full 8 channels for this. So then we can have drawer for output. I hope this will automatically insert into the drawer here. It should though, right? I think it inserts to any inventory that's here. Then we'll need an interface to supply the items. I think actually moving it down a block is going to be a little bit cleaner to work with. That way we can have the drawer on the floor. So we'll need our press mold, a power cell for power. And that's right, we will need a way to import into the metal press. The conveyor belt here won't pull from the interface here. So we can just solve that by placing a hopper. Lock the drawer. I don't think we'll put a storage downgrade on this. I'm fine with doing 32 stacks of wire, since you can see this thing is blazing fast. But we will need a way of turning this thing off, as this will keep spitting out wires even if the drawer is full. So to fix that, we can use a level emitter. And this will go into the redstone control on the side. Oh, that looks a bit strange. <laughs> but yeah, we're going to level emit this for the copper wire. And we're going to emit when levels are below, we'll say 2000 to give the, the drawer some extra buffer space. Actually, we don't want to invert this. Yeah, emit when levels are above. Clean this up with some facade. And I think we have automated wires. I also had to do a similar thing uh, for these mechanical components. As when we set this up, I noticed that these were uh, spilling out everywhere. <laughs> so um, I've hooked up actually, I've done it differently this time. I used a redstone upgrade on the drawer. So when the drawer is full, then it emits a redstone signal to this block, which I think is powering the redstone control back there. So that will stop the machine and stop us wasting the input items here. And then yeah, the red coal, where are we going to put this? We are kind of running out of spaces here. <laughs> um, I don't really know where we can put more single block machines. This is something I really, really struggle with playing this game, is trying to lay out the base. I mean, we have a resonator there, but we also have one over on this wall. Over there. <laughs> uh, I think over here is an appropriate enough space to start a new machine wall. I'm sure we're going to fill this space pretty quickly here. <laughs> uh, but I've decided we're going to add three more resonators. One is going to be for the red coal. The second one is going to be quartz burnt. And the third one is going to be upgrade bases. Actually, we're going to do four. The fourth one is going to be rainbow stone. So once again, we're going to need channels for these resonators to have an interface. But there is a line here, which we're only using three from. So in the interface, we're going to ask for blocks of coal, blocks of quartz, stone burnt for the rainbow stone, and enriched alloy. Those are then going to get insert on a filter for each resonator. And we'll also output on blue on all of these. And that will insert into a drawer controller connected to all of the drawers. So now we have all of these items on passive. And obviously the rainbow stone won't run all the time, as this does require the rainbow generator to be active, which only activates itself every once in a while when we're low on power. But when it does, it will progress towards a little bit more rainbow stone. And these upgrade bases are used actually quite a lot in the upgrades. They're also used in Ender IO extraction speed upgrades. Uh, things like limited item fillers use these things as well. So it'll be nice to keep a stock of these ones. And the last thing we'll do is storage bus the drawer controller. So I put in recipes for all of the reagents. We can request our Tempest, the Strength reagent, the Neutral reagent, and the Damage reagent. Alright, so that is now all of the Tier 1 to 3 reagents and essences automated. Only the Tier 1s are passively created right now, but eventually we will passive the 2 and 3. So let's move on to have a look at this plating. So this one takes the offensive core, some imbued slates, a defensive core. Oh, we, we made this one already, I think. And some of the concentrated catalysts. This is also tier 3, so we can do it with our existing blood orb. And so how many of these do we need? Well, it looks like we have to run it through the blood infuser after. 
So we need five for the Petal Apothecary. And they're also used in purified tablets. I don't know if we need these right now. Uh, probably though. <laughs> yeah, maybe let's see if we can try and make 10 of these things to start off with. Okay, I put in some recipes. Can we make 10? Okay, <laughs> this is not a good sign. So the imbued slates, we can't yet automate, so I'll have to craft some of those manually. Incendium is a tier 1 essence, but we don't have enough blood orbs to do this passively yet. Bronze blend and pulverized obsidian, we just have to increase buffers on the drawers. The question is though, where are those drawers? <laughs> I put concealment key on all those to try to improve the FPS around here, and actually it's helped quite a bit. But where are we making bronze blend and obsidian? Aha, I found bronze blend. Let's take out the downgrade in this thing. And we'll also increase the RF powder and GP powder up to 8 stacks of buffer. Looks like we also need a bigger buffer on the iron and tin shards, as well as the potions. You know what, maybe 10 is a little bit ambitious to start off with here. Maybe let's just start with the 5. <laughs> Can we do 5? We need more arboreal essence. Yeah, this is the thing that takes hardened blood droplets, but with the incense altar, this should be easy enough to do. So after a crazy amount of crafting and fixing buffers, I think we can request our five cracked slates. Yeah, look at some of this. 19 enders, 96 RF powder, 126 corallium gem clusters. Yeah, this craft might take a while. And in fact, we should probably consider putting hardened glass on passive. This is used in many of the different variants, and these are used all over the place. So for this, we'll need a pulverizer and an induction smeller. Pulverizer is going to be for lead dust. And then in the induction smeller, we're going to combine the pulverized lead with some pulverized obsidian to get our hardened glass. So yeah, those were two easy things to passive here and should speed up the future blood magic crafts a lot more. All right, this craft still could take a while. We're still waiting on some LP in our LP network. And we have something like 200 catalysts to make still. Yeah, 265 simple catalysts and then 113 of the strengthened. So while we wait for these alchemy tables to uh, do their thing, <laughs> let's look at the rest of Evilcraft. So to progress through Evilcraft, we need the, the next few uh, promises of tenacity. And I had a look at these earlier, but these did take the Tempestus and the Reagents. But by now we should be able to craft this stuff. Although we do only have one alchemy table. Uh, <laughs> I think we're going to just have to wait this out. And we're out of will in the Tartaric Gem as well. Alright, well in that case we can look at the next quest, which is a Box of Eternal Closure. This thing does require more cores, so we'll have to wait on these ones, but we do need large memory chests. And the large memory chests do require these advanced circuits, which we've made before. These were used in a couple of the Ender I.O. machines, and these quantum disks for the Deep Dark Portal. Although these require a couple of interesting items, primarily this Hyper Diamond, which we will have to use soon to make Mana Diamonds from Batania. Let's look into the automation of these Hyper Diamonds. So the first stage in the Hyper Diamonds is to get Industrial Grade Graphite Dust, which comes from the ore which you have to alloy smelt with HOP Graphite, Graphite Bars, and Dark Stone, which is Dark Steel and I think this is any type of stone. So what I'm thinking for this is actually, since we don't need a ton of this at the moment and we're really close to mystical agriculture, since we don't have HOP Graphite automated yet, I'm just going to wait until we get the seeds, since these are two, Tier 2 seeds. But we will set up this ore passively. And I suppose that also means we need dark stone passively. So we'll place an alloy smelter for the ore. This alloy smelter is going to get the HOP graphite, which it looks like we're actually out of at the moment. I don't know if we have any HOP dust. We only have a little bit of HOP dust. We will have to get some more coke dust. I wonder how much of that we have backlogged. Oh, that's right. We, we have coal coke on passive. Okay, so we just need to put this through the squeezer then. Alright, so once that process is down, that will go into the alloy smelter, and then we'll get our uh, graphite ore. But we do also have to auto craft this dark stone. So over here next to the resonators, I've added a mechanical crafter to craft us the dark stone. I just extended the item conduit from the back, and we have a limited item filter on here for the input items. Then we have some drawer trim to connect the drawer networks together, and we can place a drawer below this for the outputs. And we will storage downgrade this as well. I think a stack of buffer of this stuff will be enough. So that should now mean that this alloy smelter is starting to fill. Yeah, we just need the HOP graphite. Yeah, there we go. Now we're making our industrial grade graphite ore. We're going to output that to a drawer. I'm not actually sure how much of this stuff we should buffer though. Probably just a stack since there's no other use for this stuff other than to grind it down and then turn it into hyper diamonds. So I guess that means that we need a pulverizer for this thing. And in fact, because there's no other use for this thing, maybe instead of output into a drawer, we just output to this pulverizer above it. Yeah, I like that a bit more. And we'll swap this out with a frame trim. We'll plug in the pulverizer. And we'll use the drawer next to this for the graphite dust. So at this point, with the graphite dust, we have to blow this up with 
TNT or some other sort of explosion. I don't think it has to specifically be in TNT, we can use a creeper skull. But either way, we have to set up some sort of a system which drops the graphite dust, causes some sort of an explosion, and then picks up the hyper diamonds. So I just so happened to be passing this wire machine that we just made, and it was spilling its contents everywhere. <laughs> uh, yeah, we were missing a storage bus on this drawer. Luckily though, there wasn't too many wires. I think it was only two or three stacks on the floor. But that could have been potentially bad. <laughs> Alright, but I have a bit of an idea of how we're going to use this. We have the Creeper Trophy here. One of the features of the Creeper Trophy, in fact, I think maybe the only feature of the Creeper Trophy, is when it's right-clicked, we get an explosion. And this does actually work for the Hyper Diamonds. I've already tested this, uh, I think, a couple of episodes ago. So the plan is to use a mechanical user on right-click. Obviously, though, we don't want this to constantly be running. So the plan was to use some sort of a sensor from RF Tools, and this will detect the item entity on the floor. So that's the basic thinking behind this setup. I'm gonna have a go at trying to get this thing to work. Aha, I think I got this working and I managed to keep it relatively compact as well. I don't think we actually need all this space, but uh, it looks pretty cool like this. All right, so the way this works is we have the interface to supply the graphite dust. That is then extracted via this conduit set to active with the signal. And this is controlled by the level emitter, um, reading the amount of hyper diamonds we have in our system. If we are below 10, then it will extract into this precision dropper. And this will always try and drop the graphite into the world. That is then detected by this sensor, scanning an area behind the sensor, which is on the block that the dropper drops the graphite onto. And then this sends a redstone signal via this redstone conduit up to the mechanical user, which is set to redstone on which will activate the Creeper Trophy, convert to Hyper Diamonds, and then those are collected by this ranged collector we have underneath here, and then inserted into the drawer via item conduit. And then of course we have the storage bus on the frame drawer so that we can tell this level emitter how much Hyper Diamonds we currently have in our system. So if we raise this limit up to, let's say, 40, it's going to drop, I think, one more Hyper Diamond, unless we maybe had some backlogged. There may have already been some in our drives. Yeah, it looks like we had two there, so let's also set this to high priority while I remember. So now when we take those out, put them back in, they should end up in this drawer. Yeah, we have 41. So let's try and raise this level limiter to 50. Hey, that worked pretty good, actually. <laughs> we are up to 55. That is probably due to the delay on transferring from the range collector into the drawer. And also the time it takes for the dropper and the sensor to activate. But I don't mind a little bit of uh, inaccuracy in the system. Going over or under by one or two hyper diamonds is going to be fine. But yeah, we can hide all of our wiring here with some conduit facade. And same with this cable even. And just to make it symmetrical, we'll put a block on this side as well. So yeah, that gives us automated hyper diamonds. And it actually turned out relatively clean in the end. Oh yeah, there's many different ways we could have automated these hyper diamonds. Alright, let's see how far our blood magic craft is getting on. We are almost done with this craft here. I've just had to cancel to be able to get access to the blood orb though. As this, some of these crafts do require a higher tier. Although I noticed that for one of these quest rewards, I think it's this one, we do get an extra Magician Blood Orb for free. But probably between episodes, I'll craft up the rest that we need for all of our alchemy table setups. Alright, so after cancelling the craft a bunch of times to craft all of the reagents separately, I think we can now restart this cracked runic plate craft, as all of this is just uh, crafting table recipes actually. Except the last step here, which uh, will require our Blood Orb, so <laughs> I think we have to cancel this once again, pick up the Blood Orb from the system and put it in this crafting table. But now we're crafting. I think I may have to fill this one up since, yeah, we need to wait for 10,000 LP every every cracked plate. And this can only be done with this this tier of Blood Orb. Yeah, there's 11,000. <laughs> we can get one more plate. All right, this is the last runic plate. That only took, well, four episodes to get there. <laughs> All right, we'll claim our Blood Orb for this. But now we need the rest of the evil craft stuff, which is two Tempest cores. We have everything to craft this now. And yeah, I'm, I'm really glad I didn't rush through this chapter because there is a lot of infrastructure required for blood magic here. Alright, we got the two Tempest cores, we got two more Ball of Promises. These are Strength 2, so you have to run these through the Blood Infuser twice. But now we can get our Promise of Tenacity 3. This should be our quest. And free reagents, I'll definitely take those. Alright, so now do we have to do all of these other ones as well? If I was to guess, I would say yeah. <laughs> We do. Um, well, we also need the Vengeance Ring, which takes four magical cores. Uh, let's maybe just get those crafted. Can we even request these four magical cores? We're just missing the Blood Orb. Okay. Actually, we need six magical cores. We need another two for this box of Eternal Closure. 
I still don't know what this is used for though, but either way we need two more magical cores. I did also put in the recipe for the memory chest. So we have two of those crafted, which takes the hyper diamonds. Yeah, this is a lot of crafting here at the end of this chapter. Um, so we need another bowl of promise. In fact, a couple of bowl of promises, which take aquasalis. Let's put in the recipe for this, since we use it quite a lot. Well, we wait for some more alchemy table crafts again. We can put the new runic plates through our blood infuser. How much blood does this take each? 200,000 blood each. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad I got this going a while ago. Hopefully we have a, a big enough buffer for this thing. Oh nice, this also gives us a Dread Crystal quest reward. These Dread Crystals are used in, well, I guess we can make the Digital Miner, but I don't know if there's much use for this at this point. But we can also use this to make more Blood Altars, which we will eventually want to have at some point. Or maybe the Weak Blood Orb, but this seems rather expensive for a Weak Blood Orb. So maybe we'll just make the higher tier ones instead. And by the looks of things, we may have run out of Blood Buffer for the last two plates here. I have kept this farm on, so it has been running all episode. But it's possible that we filled the whole buffer here and we were just ending up voiding the excess. Which probably means we should add a bigger tank here. Also, I'm not sure if there's a way to upgrade this plate later on. To uh, be able to extract more blood from the mobs. Yeah, so to get the rest of these quests, we need hundreds of thousands of millibuckets of blood here. Which means I don't think we can finish off the chapter this episode. We were so close, <laughs> but yeah, we need 200,000 blood per slate. We can get our bowl though. But let's at least try to get this little box and see what this thing does. Looks like we need it for blocks of ender. We can leave these plates in here and eventually it'll craft down. So can we craft our box here? We can craft the box. Nice. Question is though, will it finish? <laughs> oh hey, it did finish. Alright, so by reading the quest here we have to place this down, right click it to open and shoot a spirit with a vengeance focus to trap it inside the box. I don't know what a vengeance focus is. I'm assuming that is what this is. But it looks like to unlock this, we need to do all of these other gems over here. And this ring also requires some more dark power gems, which is more blood that we don't don't have today. So yeah, I think we're going to wrap up things here for today. It may not seem like a lot of progress today, but we actually got a lot of the, the tedious things automated. And I would rather not rush through the quest book, as it's going to make later chapters a lot easier. I'm also quite liking how this area of the base is turning out. These are not the most space efficient setups, but uh, I kind of like it. There is lots more building still to do, but yeah, <laughs> one thing at a time. So yeah, that is going to do us for today. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you all tomorrow for some more Divine Journey 2.